Hello everyone. If you are still trading your Bollinger Bands, MACDs, vol uh, volume profile, all that other bullshit, good luck to you. But here we're going to have a lesson on something that works. So, with that being said, all of my affiliate links are in the description box below. Please make sure to go click on those. Uh, use my affiliate links for all your stuff. And trading view is there. Um, okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about the glossary that of which I'm aware of all of the inefficiencies in the marketplace that Michael has talked about. And we're going to go through them one by one. And um, take a look um, on different products uh, where we can find them. We're going to talk about, about them. They all kind of act very similarly, but I want you to be able to identify them um, in the marketplace when you are trading and be able to uh, identify them. So there are, there are eight. And if you want to screenshot the screen right now, these are all the ones that I'm aware of. Um, uh, number one is liquidity void, which is an actual gap. Number two is a fair value gap. Three is volume imbalance. Four is a very long wick. Five is regular trading hours gap. Six is a new week opening gap. Seven is a new day opening gap. And number eight is a contract delivery month inefficiency. So we'll talk about all of these. So uh, I'm here on gold and what I'm looking for is if I can find any actual uh, liquidity voids. I don't think I can. Let's go to crude oil. I think they're here. Need to find a hole. You oftentimes find them on newer contracts. Okay, yeah, I found one. So, a liquidity void is our first inefficiency that we're going to talk about. A liquidity void is where price has been inefficient, like here, because there has been no trading at that price. You're oftentimes going to find liqu actual liquidity voids um, when you're looking at new contracts or you're looking at uh, the back month contract so you're not looking at the front month contract you're looking at the back month contract a liquidity void is a place of high inefficiency because it is where there's been no trading so not only has one side of the marketplace so not been offered neither side of the marketplace has been offered a liquidity void similar to a fair value gap or any other inefficiency can invert so a liquidity void can offer dynamic support and resistance to the marketplace. And it can invert uh, as well. So, for example, we see it here on crude oil, we have a liquidity void. There's been no trading there. So this is an actual gap. And when price came back down to it, notice that it first found support there. And then as we came and traded back down, we traded back up to it, it found resistance and then traded lower. So, like every one of the uh, ICT inefficiencies, price is going to end up drawing to these liquidity voids. And on the first pass down, you're going to see oftentimes that these liquidity voids are going to serve as dynamic support resistance. And so when it comes back down to the liquidity void, you might get an initial reaction and then a move through it, or it might just straight out reverse at the liquidity void. So the liquidity void is a good place at which to look to take some profits or take take part of the position off if you're especially if you're not very clear on where the draw on liquidity is let me see if we can see any liquidity voids here on the daily chart on crude oil yeah so you can see here friday um <clears throat> well that's a new week opening gap all right i'm just going to leave it with we'll leave it with that example so our first um, inefficiency to look out in the marketplace for is is probably obviously the most identifiable one uh, because it is an actual gap in trading and like every other every one of other Mike of Michael's inefficiencies it will act as a, an area of interest an area that will draw price to said area and it will act as an area of dynamic support and resistance and so you oftentimes see that price will react um, at the 25, 50, and 75 percent levels of these liquidity voids. And if price trades through the liquidity voids, you expect it to act as an area of dynamic support resistance. In other words, a liquidity void or an actual gap, just like every other inefficiency, can invert. 
we can have an inverted liquidity void. The second um, ICT inefficiency, and let's see if we can go to a different product to show it. Let's go to Euro Futures. So, we're in a five minute time frame. Let's go to a 15 minute time frame and let's go ahead and mark out the fair value gap. The fair value gap is a little bit of a different animal to the... <clears throat> I'm going to mark it out here for you too. So the fair value gap is a three, um, it's a three candle pattern and is where you can see that only one side of the marketplace has been offered. So you take, if you see that there's no wick back down between the three candles, there's only the candle body, that is a fair value gap. They're very common. Um, there's one here, there's one here, um, they're, they're, they're very common. So it's just a separation between candle one and candle three. You take it, for example, your first candle here, the high to the open of the third candle. They come in two varieties. The one that I highlighted here in the red box is called a BISI. It is a buy side imbalance sell side inefficiency, meaning that it is inefficient to the sell side. Why is it inefficient to the sell side? Inefficient to the sell side because the point at which you have the candle body here, there was no selling, there was no amount of selling that was offered to the marketplace. And similarly, um, let's go find a, a SIBI. So this here is a SIBI, S-I-B-I, what I'm highlighting with the cursor. It's called a sell side imbalance buy side inefficiency. It means that for this portion of trading, there was inefficient trading to the buy side, which means that oftentimes price is, it, it means a number of different things, but it is a price at which the, the marketplace was inefficient to the buy side. So it was a sell side imbalance buy side inefficiency, which is oftentimes why you'll hear me talk about that. It's just a buy side inefficiency. A fair value gap is going to act very much like a liquidity void and all of our other ICT patterns in that it will tend to draw price down back to it. When price comes back down to the fair value gap, you can take the fair value gap and take it into quarters using a Fibonacci retracement tool. If you want to see a fair value gap offer dynamic support and resistance, ideally you would like to see that the candles are failing to close below the 75% retracement here, for example, of this BISI, buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. A fair value gap can, can act as a draw on liquidity and it can also act as an area of dynamic support and resistance. So what do I mean by that? Say for example that the Euro futures had traded back down through this BISI. We would then expect it to trade back up and then back down. That is called an inverted fair value gap, where price uses a fair value gap as an, uh, as an inverted or dynamic support and resistance. So we could see, for example, that here, in both instances, the Euro futures used these buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiencies as a draw first on liquidity. So price went up higher than the fair value gap, drew back to it, and then acted as dynamic support and resistance. Okay, I want to see if I can potentially find an example of an inverted fair value gap. I don't know if I can find one just looking I think that'll do it. I believe that would be a good example. So right here, we have a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. Pull that over. Okay. We take a look at our red box here. We are sell side inefficient, meaning that from this point that I'm highlighting on the cursor to the first point, the marketplace failed to offer the market to the sell side. 
you can see that this inefficiency was referenced by the trading algorithms multiple times and it could offer you an area first as an entry to the long side again as an entry to the long side and then it inverted and was an area of resistance so let me show that for you here so we can see that as price traded above this buy side inefficiency for the first time 30 minutes later the price came down ticked down into it and immediately went higher that pattern there is what Michael Huddleston refers to as an institutional order flow entry drill and essentially what that is is a pattern in which a fair value gap forms and then price trades one or two ticks into it and then moves in the same direction that's called an institutional order flow entry drill and it's basically where the inefficiency is first used as an area of support now we can see here that the same fair value gap was treated as support for a second time okay and that's your standard dynamic support resistance that you see with a with uh, with all of these inefficiencies the critical factor is not only that these can act as dynamic support resistance on the first pass but they actually also invert so we can see the price traded below the fair value gap went back up and then used that as resistance and wicked back down that is called inverting the fair value gap it is an inverted fair value gap and it is where an inefficiency has acted to basically um, you would call it a break and retest but it's it, yeah it's the same principle but you're using this inefficiency as dynamic support resistance so that we see here support once support twice now when the same when the same fair value gap is offered as support twice or more times that's called a reclaimed a reclaimed fair value gap similar to a reclaimed order block when you trade through though immediately you can see that it offered resistance okay support twice resistance once before price moved lower that is the value of these inefficiencies they are there are many things they are a draw on liquidity meaning that price will want to come back and offer this same sell side inefficient price to the sell side which it did they will act as uh, su dynamic support resistance and they will also invert when price trades through them and so you can see that these inefficiencies are referenced by the algorithms multiple times and they can be very critical to your algorithmic theory trading <clears throat> so that is the fair value gap and let me remove the drawings there let's go back to gold futures I know that many of you trade gold and let's see if we can find a volume imbalance maybe one that price actually used there's a fair value gap right there so same principle that I just showed you fair value gap comes down trades into it and uses it as support we just talked about that so that was a fair value gap example volume imbalance I know what I actually want to use to talk about a volume imbalance yeah okay let's go over here we'll use this make it nice and difficult for you the third type of inefficiency is called a volume imbalance a volume imbalance is where there is separation between two candles and there are only wicks offered it's similar in concept to all the other inefficiencies in that price at that area was inefficient these are often small they're often not very large inefficiencies however they can be critical at certain moments of time so let me go to the ES I'm gonna switch over to the ES and I want to show you something I think came on Thursday okay because I actually traded this right there we have our volume imbalance so what makes this inefficient well it's essentially an area of thin trading so whereas the liquidity void is no trading the fair value gap is one-sided trading the volume imbalance is 
thin trading, and so it was thinly traded to both sides. Thus, it is the same principle as all of the other ICT inefficiencies, and that is that it can be used as a draw on liquidity and as a, an area of dynamic support and resistance, and it can invert. So, this was when Jerome Powell was speaking right here on Wednesday. Okay, now what is price draw to? Now, we're going to talk about the very long wick inefficiency, so I'm just going to uh, ignore that for a second. Have a look right there. This is when Jerome Powell was speaking, and you know the market was all scary, scary. Drew right down to where we expected, which is this volume imbalance. Now, notice that. Um, even though price did trade through it, the bodies of the candles um, closed very close to this volume imbalance, found support, and traded higher. That is the magic of ICT's um, inefficiencies. They are a draw on liquidity, they are dynamic support and resistance, and they can invert as well. So they are very critical to algorithmic theory. A volume imbalance, just one more time, is identified where there are only wicks between two candle bodies. They're fairly common, and you will see them alongside all of the other inefficiencies. And they're all over the place. They're not that um, difficult to spot. They're often very small. There's another one right there. And you can see the price use that right there as an immediate, um, immediate support right there at 44.24. So that right there was a five tick trade off the volume imbalance. Again, we have a volume imbalance and you can see the price essentially comes up, respects it, turns lower. Um, there was also a fair value gap here. You will oftentimes see that these inefficiencies are uh, paired with one another. Okay, They might also be paired with an order block. And it's just showing you um, a price area in which price was inefficiently delivered. And what does that mean? It means the price is going to be drawn to it. So we see two concepts here that are playing out at the same time. First, we have a fair value gap, which is right here. Okay, Price comes back and uses this fair value gap. This is also a volume imbalance. Okay, So price was this right here up, at, up until 44, 19 th and 3 quarters. Was, an, was a price area of inefficient delivery. So price went down, curled back up into this inefficiently delivered price to the buy side, and then turned lower. Okay, so we talked about the volume imbalance. Let's talk now. We're on the E-mini S&P futures, and let's talk about the very long wick. The very long wick. And let's go to the 30-year bond to show this. Let's go to our regular trading hours and see if we see it there. Uh, let's keep on electronic. Okay. This is the very long wick. The very long wick is an inefficient price delivery. It is showing you where there has been thin trading. Now, as opposed to the difference between the very long wick and your other inefficiencies is that price was offered there, but it was just very thinly offered. So, for example, with your liquidity void, it's not that there was no trading here, it was that it was just very thinly traded. Now, the very long wick is an inefficient price delivery similar to all of our other inefficiencies. And what does that mean? That means that price is going to be drawn in order to re-deliver into usually with these very long wicks you can draw them out into quarters in the same manner that you draw out all of your other inefficiencies into quarters and as you can use with all of your other inefficiencies it's going to offer dynamic support and resistance so we see here it first offers resistance we then trade through it okay come back down what do we see here we see right here that price uses this very long wick as an inverted dynamic support and resistance right there. So the long wick is a draw on liquidity and, is, and it's an interest um, 
it's inefficient price delivery like any of the other um, inefficiencies. I would say my overall experience with very long wicks is that they are not as easy to manage or not as um, reliable as the other inefficiencies. With that being said, you need to be aware of them because it is an area of inefficient price delivery and price is going to be drawn to re-deliver said inefficient price delivery. So you need to be aware of your very long wicks. The NASDAQ is quite um, prominent with its very long wicks. We could see here, for example, that as we came down here at 945 on Friday, we had a very long wick, and price drew back into said very long wick. And it came right down just about to the 25% of said wick, and then traded higher. You often sometimes see that these very long wicks will do that. They will be a drawn liquidity, and then you can take them into quarters just like this, and they will act as dynamic support and resistance. So whenever you're holding on the trades and you see very long wicks, you need to be cognizant of them because you're probably going to see a reaction from price. You might see a reaction from price off of said very long wicks. And we see the same thing here. Very long wick, price trades into it, uses it as support, okay, trades through it, and then when it comes back, price uses it as an area of resistance and then trades lower again. So we can see that it is dynamic support and resistance, just like all of our other inefficiencies. Let's see what the next one is on the list. The regular trading hours gap. The regular trading hours gap On trading view, in order to see the regular trading hours gap, you will need to go to the bottom right and you need to click sessions, go from electronic trading hours to regular trading hours. The regular trading hours gap is only showing you the New York session, the New York AM and PM session. It's going to remove all of the trading from the overnight session. The regular trading hours gap is especially effective on US based products like the stock indices the 30-year bond, um, dollar index doesn't have it, uh, crude oil will, will reference the regular trading hours gap, and the natural gas, uh, so your energy products are also going to reference. You can see that we have regular trading hours gaps. And it's going to hide all of the price action from the Globex session. The regular trading hours gap becomes a little bit less reliable when you're talking about primarily European products such as Forex. However, that does not mean that you should ignore them. Because, for example, we see here on the Euro futures, although it is Euro futures and it is Forex, well, what do we see right there? Price uses the regular trading hours gap as uh, dynamic support and resistance. So, um, the regular trading hours gap, like all of our other inefficiencies, is a draw on liquidity and it is an area of dynamic support and resistance. So, let's go to the NASDAQ and let's we're on a 15 minute chart and let's take our regular trading hours gap into quarters like we do with all of our inefficiencies. On Friday, on our last day of trading this week, we had a prominent regular trading hours gap on all of our stock indices. And one of the trades, simple trade ideas that you had during, during the day to day was to short any of the stock indices as they came up and retraced into the regular trading hours gap. What you want to do with the regular trading hours gaps is use them as dynamic support resistance and a draw on liquidity and draw them out into quarters. Oftentimes, um, for example, let's say that you traded down. If you see that price is respecting the 50% of the regular trading hours gap, okay, it's so using that as an area of resistance and maybe you pair it with another one of ICT's concepts like an order block, breaker block, whatever very strong inclination there that price is probably going to turn. We saw that exactly at the 50% on the YM today. We saw that on the um, E-mini S&P 500 right at about that 50% 50, 50 go short as it comes up to the 50% and trade lower very simple trading idea um, and very powerful. So we see the same thing on the Dow. We saw the same thing on the NASDAQ. 
and we saw the exact same thing on the Russell 2000. So the regular trading hours gap, if you ever wonder what price actually looks like, this is what it actually looks like with big gaping holes in it. Ergo, why price appears to you during the Globex session or during the open resettlement to move so much is it's repricing it, uh, into these regular trading hours gaps. Now, many of you are going to be foreigners and you're going to be looking at uh, Forex. You can't trade U.S. futures products, so you you know the only you can you only trade Forex, right? So if that is the case and you're a foreigner and you can only trade um, Forex, then one thing that you should be aware of, like for example, on gold, <clears throat> gold. Although it is primarily traded, you know, it's, I would say its biggest session is London. Um, you want to be aware of your regular trading hours gaps even when you are a European. And that's because these markets are based out of New York. And they're going to be drawn to regular trading hours gaps um, like anything else. So, uh, for example, we see here on Friday that... Um, if you were on electronic trading, you'd see a big, uh, you'd see a big green candle here. But what it essentially was doing on resettlement today was it was just coming up and, and refilling and offering price back at uh, thir back at Wednesday's trading. It was just resettling back up into Wednesday's trading and then trading back down into the uh, regular trading hours gap, which is here. Like any one of the other inefficiencies. The regular trading hours gap can act as dynamic support and resistance and can be inverted. It is oftentimes a major factor, a major player in all markets, the regular trading hours gap, and it can act as a, uh, a very strong draw on liquidity. When using your regular trading hours gap for support and resistance, you want to take it into quarters and the way that I've shown here. So I just take a fib, I'll show you the settings, 25, 50, 75. You go on like your 15 minute chart, 10 minute chart, pull your regular trading hours gap into quarters. And if you see that price is using, say, the 50%, 75%, it appears to be finding support or resistance there, that's a, that's a likely profitable trade. Okay? It's, it's, a good, it's a good trading idea. We see here, for example, on gold futures that we had a regular trading hours gap. Um, come in and it found support right at that 50% and then we came back up and we filled in this regular trading hours gap here. So that trade would have taken you from 1965 spot 6 all the way up into 1974. And so that's a um, that's using the regular trading hours gaps at, again as dynamic support and resistance. So that is the index of that is uh, the regular trading hours gap. Let's see if we can find a new week opening gap. We're down to our let's go down to our back to our ES and let's they were they were there. Um, let's see, we have one. The new week opening gap is the difference between where price uh, price resettles on Sunday, excuse me, on Friday, and then coming into Sunday or Monday at 9:30. New week opening gap. So what you need to do is you need to here we can see Sunday, Monday, Friday. Close here, open here. It is the difference between where price closes on Friday and opens on Monday. And ICT says to use uh, five of them. The new week opening app is not a concept that I particularly use in my trading, but it is something to be aware of. It is an inefficient, inefficiently delivered price. Okay, inefficiently delivered price. 
that is caused by the resettlement over the weekend. It is a draw on liquidity, just like any other one of these inefficiencies. It's, a, it's going to be a draw on liquidity, and it's also going to act as dynamic support and resistance. And you take it, you find it, by looking at the difference between Friday's closing price and Sunday's opening price. That is your new week opening gap. New day opening gap. And the YM had a prominent one. That's why I'm going to the YM right here. When you are trading um, futures, there is a one hour resettlement period between 5 o'clock New York local time and 6 o'clock New York local time. Oftentimes that resettlement period won't have any gap at all, but sometimes it will. So you can see here on between Tuesday and Wednesday, um, so Tuesday at 1650 and then Tuesday at, at 1800, you can see that the Dow futures had a liquidity void here. Now the price was inefficiently delivered all throughout this long wick. Um, but our actual liquidity void was where the two red lines are. The two red lines are a new day opening gap. They are a draw on liquidity. They may be taken into quarters, just like every one of the other inefficiencies, and they act as dynamic support and resistance. So we can see here on the YM, the price trades back up through this long wick here. Okay, trades all the way through it to re-deliver that price. We then come up to the new day opening gap. And then as soon as you see that price appears to be respecting the 25% of this new day opening gap, that is a shorting opportunity. And you can see that it took you significantly lower. We again, believe it or not, much, much later, and you take a look at that. That is price much later using the new day opening gap that we had formed on Tuesday the 13th of June all the way back on Monday the 19th of June and what is that? That is a rejection that is a uh, an area of dynamic support and resistance here on the YM and we can see that all throughout the remainder of the week that same exact price was an area of dynamic support and resistance so as with any of Michael's inefficiencies the new day opening gap, it is formed between the resettlement, the one hour resettlement period. It is a draw on liquidity and it is an area of dynamic support and resistance, meaning that price can come up to it and then trade lower, so immediate resistance, or it can trade through it and then when it comes back to it, find support there and that is your inversion, or your inverted new day opening gap. All of these inefficiencies can invert and that is why they are dynamic support and resistance. Contract delivery month inefficiency. At all times on all of these products, there are multiple contract delivery months being traded at the same time. So let's go to our ESU, and this is what our daily time frame looks like on the ESU. The ESU is the September delivery contract month. The next delivery contract month is December. As you can see, there is a premium in the December contract. Now, the December contract looks different from the September contract. As September, the September contract is the front month. The December contract here, ESZ 2023, on the, uh, is the back month. <laughs> the December contract is going to allow you to see areas of thinly traded price that might not be visible on the front month. So for example, we can see here, that is a area right there, a very thinly traded price. So this is right here. We have a gap here a gap into a volume imbalance, so a very thinly, inefficiently delivered price. Now, that is not visible on our um, September contract month. 
but it is visible on the December contract month and of course the ES on the daily time frame found resistance there. So when you are examining price on your daily and weekly time frames if you want to find some inefficiencies that might not be visible on the front month you will need to go to the next contract delivery month um, in order to find inefficiencies that you're looking for in the marketplace. Um, as contracts come to their expiration, to come to their rollover, that is oftentimes when you might see a change in market environment. Um, but anyways, those are contract delivery month inefficiencies. So you want to look at your front month and you look at your back month. It's the weekly time frame. So you can see on the September contract, they look a little bit different. Okay, They look a little bit different. Um, and you can see the differences in the two contracts here. The December contract is obviously trading at a premium that the uh, September contract is not. And so you can, you can go through these charts. I'll put them both on the daily. And even though they're the same product, you will see that they look slightly different. And the December contract, for example, what it's showing you is that Um, we've got liquidity voids here, liquidity voids here, we've got a balanced price range here, we've got a volume imbalance here, uh, another volume imbalance here, uh, fair value gaps throughout. So well, what you're seeing on the December contract is that coming into the next few months, we're probably going to trade lower on the ES as the December contract is going to want to come back and draw into these inefficiencies that you don't exactly see on the September contract, but you can see them on the December contract which is our next month, our next delivery contract month. So those are contract month uh, inefficiencies and they are valuable for your higher time frame analyses. You can see here on the December contract month liquidity void down in this area that is not visible on the September contract. So contract delivery month inefficiencies are something to look at for your uh, longer term. And with that being said, this has been a glossary of the ICT inefficiencies of which I am aware. I hope that you found this information useful. If you did, please make sure to like the video, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and my affiliate links are in the description. Um, if I'm putting in all the work to provide this information to you for free, really the least you can do is give me some interaction on the video. Uh, I'm not getting paid to do this, but I do enjoy it. So um, if you're not gonna go use any of my affiliate links, uh, because you don't want to, you have no money, that's fine. Uh, please just, you know, give me some interaction on the video or subscribe. Because uh, you're getting a lot of free shit here. So, with that being said, um, y'all have a good one. Bye.